And on Zoom, my name is Dave Bayless. I am the new department chair in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. George Lino Holmes, Jr., who is a graduate of the Missouri University of Science and Technology. So he's one of you all. Uh, Dr. Holmes, uh, academic research focused on the intersection of human-robot interaction, mechatronic design, and robotics, including the mathematical derivation, software simulation, and hardware implementation of advanced sensing and control algorithms. Academically and commercially, he has, re he has developed and managed teams of graduate and undergraduate students in building autonomous research robots in software and hardware, including design of individual components, part selection, performance testing, and control algorithm implementation. He fell in love with robotics after an internship with the car company Honda, where he worked in automotive interior quality tracking of customer complaints, engineering design, assembly, and fabrication. He has worked with Rockwell Automation, industrial automation, on consumer, pharmaceutical, and precious metal production lines. You're gonna have to tell me about that one sometime. <laughs> As co-founder and CEO of Hire Henry, he leads the development of the company's R&D plan, strategic milestones, intellectual property protection, company formation, fundraising, and network security. Additionally, he is involved in product design, fabrication, and software integration. So if you didn't catch all those things he's involved with, I'm sure he's gonna tell you and more because when you're an entrepreneur, that's what you do. You, you carry the water wherever it's needed. On a personal note to all of our audience, I really want you to listen closely to his story. Because even though you might not think you're ever going to be an entrepreneur, I can guarantee you this. As engineers, you're going to come up with a better idea, a better thing out there. I, I don't know what it's going to be. It could be a better way to make something, it could be a new control system, it could be a new energy conversion process, whatever. You're going you're gonna to see it. Now, if you're lucky and you're working for a nice progressive company, they may want to uh, adopt that innovation and put all the effort into bringing it to fruition. But here's the reality of the world. Change is hard. Even when you have a great idea that seems very well potentially proven, that change takes a champion. And trust me, you have the ability to be that champion. That's right. So listen to Dr. Holmes' story. He will tell you how he has championed change and built a company. And with and for that, I am really grateful that you're here today to share your journey with our students. Absolutely. So thank you. So Thanks, take it Dave. away, George. Dave is a relatively new department chair here at the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department at Missouri S&T. And when I started to talk to Dave early on, when he started working on campus, I got extraordinarily excited. He has a background in entrepreneurship. He sees the value of entrepreneurship firsthand. And I think as a Missouri s and community, we have phenomenal students, graduate students and undergraduates that have a, a lot of potential to start some really good companies. We're going to talk more about what I've learned going through my process, some important resources. I'm going to talk a little bit about my story that I think you might be able to take some key takeaways and maybe apply to your own personal life. First thing that I want to touch on very briefly here is when you talk to people about whatever it is you're working on, they're typically not thinking about it the same way you are as an engineer, or as a graduate student, or, or, or as somebody in the public talking to a business person. When you hear robot, you're probably thinking about one of the six items that you see on the screen right now. Some kids in high school may be playing with robots, some crazy fantasy in a movie about robots taking over the world, which is of course not reality, the iRoomba robot that walks around the house and vacuum cleans, or robots in cages for manufacturing that's not interacting with people much at all. Perhaps you're thinking about a research robot that you work with in your lab. Very few people think about a Tesla as a robot, 
Although we know very soon with full autonomy, it is going to be a robot. So when you say robot, most people are thinking something drastically different. When we talk about higher Henry developing collaborative, autonomous robotic mowers for commercial lawn care, it really does require some definition. It requires us to define what that means, and I'm going to spend some time doing that here this evening. But before I do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on myself. Dave gave you the brief overview. I'm from St. Louis. I went to two high schools. One was for academics, Hazelwood Central High School. The second high school was a technical high school, North County Tech. And I studied automotive mechanics. My dream was to be a master mechanic and go work behind them, working on all their cars. My grandma told me my senior year in high school, why don't you go to Missouri S&T and you can learn how to design cars instead of working on them. So I came to campus and I fell in love. Completely loved this idea of people walking around and learning all these different things. And I just fell in love. I thought it was a beautiful campus. So I came to Missouri S&T the fall of 2011 with the pure intention of I'm going to design cars for Honda one day. The summer after my sophomore year, I get an internship with Honda, dream internship. It's up in Ohio where they produce all the Honda CRVs. I've had two Honda CRVs and the Honda Accords. My first car was a Honda Accord. So this is a dream for me. And I would spend hours walking around the factory floor, like Dave mentioned, diagnosing and troubleshooting complaints that people have with their Honda CRVs. You got a steering wheel with rub? Okay, well, I'm going to figure out is that the design process of how they're designing it in uh, Japan, or is it the way that folks are assembling the product, or perhaps it's the materials that's used. Went through that entire troubleshooting process. And what I loved about being on the line was the robotics, seeing how things really come together. Thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But I figured out during the internship that cars wasn't for me. I didn't want to design cars, and I really started getting interested about uh, robotics. Came back to Missouri s and and took a class called Modeling and Analysis of Dynamic Systems completely changed my life. After that, I did undergraduate research. I got internships at Rockwell Automation. I did an internship with the school about entrepreneurship, still trying to figure out how to connect all these different things. Fast forward to my senior year of undergrad. A professor says, I got an opportunity, George, for you to get your PhD in robotics. Are you interested? Absolutely. Right? You can see how in each stage, you never know for all these years where it's about to connect and how it's about to go into that last minute when you're presented with some opportunity. Ended up getting my PhD in robotics and really focusing during that time on entrepreneurship. Four big takeaways that I took away from my PhD process. Or four things that I'm most proud of, I should say. One, we got a grant from the National Science Foundation, a proposal that I wrote myself I had to recruit a PI that was a faculty member, recruited Katie, who was an undergraduate. We'll talk more about her. That's my co-founder. And we submitted this proposal to the National Science Foundation. Got some funds, the first funds to fund the business. And then we started to work with the university to make this thing a reality. Now granted, as we go through these four things, you'll see that none of this is what a traditional PhD typically does. Right? You should be focused on publications, journal articles, conferences, not writing proposals for a business. Instead, we wrote the proposal. We got two provisional patents that I co-authored with a couple of patent attorneys, one of the best law firms in the country called Postinelli. And I knew none of this would be possible without the phenomenal fellowship that I got to fund my studies that allowed me to have some flexibility in the work that I did. And all these things culminate to one thing that I'm most proud of. And that's the undergraduate students that I was allowed to work with through undergraduate research. One of those students was Katie. They're sitting here in the room. The folks on the camera can't see Katie. But she was an undergraduate. We started working together, doing research. We found out that in one of the rooms in Toomey, they had some old equipment that would allow you to track robots and be able to implement algorithms. It was about a quarter million dollar worth of software and hardware that wasn't being used. A faculty member had left, and they just left it there, open for whoever wanted to take it over. So Katie and I got in there. We got the approval that we needed and started to learn how to work with this new hardware and software. Wrote our own software to make it happen. Did all the network security stuff. And I said, Katie's phenomenal. I want her to join the company with me. And she graciously accepted. And we've been killing it ever since. 
Since then, we've developed a fully functional prototype of this robotic mower that we call Henry. You can see it back here compared to one of the other robotic mowers that you'll see out there on the market. We've recruited teams of phenomenal mentors. We've filed three provisional patents. We've gone through this process of learning about liability, insurance, and product certification and compliance. We've gone through forming our company as a Delaware C Corporation, which is absolutely crucial. If you want to start up, don't try to do a Florida LLC. You got to be a Delaware C Corp. We've raised over $130,000 $130, worth of funding, and our social media engagement right now is through the roof. Okay, and the last point is very important because we're going to raise more money soon. You got to have this tribe, this team of folks that really believe in what we're trying to accomplish, and that's what we've been building. We're not here to talk about technology. We're not here to talk about what exactly higher Henry does, but I want to briefly talk about how our users are able to go into our proprietary software, define the area that needs to be mowed, then take our robotic mower, set it out in the field, press go, and then mow the grass completely by itself. We've designed this such that it's portable and compact. It can fit in the back of a subcompact car. Therefore, there's no longer a need for expensive trucks, trailers, equipment, insurance, or storage facilities. We've made it a lot more compact, and we think that that's going to open up the market to folks that never considered commercial lawn care before. If you've ever been to any one of my presentations, this, this quote is in just about each presentation. I absolutely love it. If you don't let me help you, you will drown. Kindly said the monkey as he put the fish in the tree. It's an old Buddhist proverb. If you don't let me help you, you will drown. Kindly said the monkey as he put the fish in the tree. And what it really means is that folks will try to help you out, they'll try to give you the right guidance and advice, but in the process, if they don't understand your perspective, they don't understand your goals, they can actually end up hurting. And it's a lot of bad advice in startups, and specifically if you come into graduate school not knowing what you want to do next, it's very easy to go down a path of just hitting publications and competing on that level and not really designing your journey for where you want to end up. Of course, this is not a monkey. This is a gorilla. I'm, I'm curious if anybody noticed that. When I Googled monkey, a gorilla popped up. I was like, huh, I like this picture. I'm just going to include it. I wonder if anybody's going to notice it's a gorilla. <laughs> The second thing that I really enjoyed about, you know, the idea of starting a company is one, you know, defining one's own path. I really wanted to learn about how to commercialize a product and how to provide patents and how to give people jobs. I think that's great. But the other thing is that I had a phenomenal culture with the other graduate students here on campus. One of my lab mates is here, Sumba. He came here today, which I appreciate. But we had a great time while we were going through our PhD studies. It was relaxed, and I didn't think that I would ever be able to find a company that would be able to provide me with that type of experience. I wanted to make it myself and give other students the opportunity to come work at a company that fits the lifestyle that they may want to live. Anybody notice what this is off the top of the head? Folks that are in the, in the chat, if you know what this is, put a one in the chat. For the one in the chat, if you know what this is. Is that a guess on the floor? Cotton mill. Cotton, cotton, cotton mill, cotton gin. That's right. This is the cotton gin, invented in 1793. There's been a, a wide array of technologies that have completely revolutionized the way we live, but this one is extraordinarily important to me. You'll see the statistics under there. When the cotton gin was invented, shortly thereafter, we went from over 750,000 bales of cotton in 1830 to a little bit over 2.8 million in 1850. And the result of making this happen is that enslaved people in the United States had to go from 700,000 in 1790 to over 3 million in 1850 of enslaved people that were required to make this happen. All this from a mechanical engineer, design and technology. The impact of what we design has a profound effect on the world. And I think nothing illustrates that better for me personally than the cotton gene. It's wooden. Katie and I was watching a video of this working a while ago. It's something so simple. A piece of wood completely revolutionized uh, the way that our country developed. So think about that. Not only did you think about your ideas, but as I go through this presentation about higher energy, 
You're going to see how what we're building with a robotic lawnmower may very well completely disrupt and revolutionize the way people work here in the United States. As I talk about higher Henry, I'm going to talk about how our focus has been bridging the perspectives of business folks to engineering. Because really, guys, we think, we think differently about a lot of different things. And it's, it is a challenge to, to, to make that, that bridge and that jump. Partly because there's not a lot of explanation. They don't know why it's a gap. We got to figure out if, if, what the gap is as entrepreneurs. So I'm going to talk about the insights that I've learned with bridging that gap. And then the second biggest piece I want to focus on here is that the focus of a business is really not technology, it's strategy. How do we use technology to build a big business, right? I'm going to share some resources that's been extraordinarily helpful for me in building that strategy. The first piece. Bridging the perspectives from engineering to business. This is one of my favorite entrepreneurs. He's an engineer. His name is Robert F. Smith. He was a chemical engineer. He went off to, to start an a equity fund, venture capitalist, called Vista Equity. And he's worth over $7 billion now. But he has this idea of using what he learned in engineering to start these businesses. And he talks about how you need to become an expert in your craft. If you ever get a chance to to learn more about what entrepreneurship is and you want to hear it from a good engineering perspective, that's one of the folks that I would highly recommend you take a look at. The other thing that I want to point out here is that you want to be able to show off your ugly baby. Right? When, when Katie and I got started with Hire Henry, what we had at the time was ugly. This is actually relatively recent. This is our, um, this is our um, rendering of the commercial grade robotic mower that we call Henry. And let me tell you guys what, when we started to, um, when we started to show this off to investors and business folks, they loved it. We was like, this is the simplest thing. Y'all love this? We would put together hardware prototypes, half falling apart, parts missing, and they would love it. So no matter what it is that you're building, no matter how early stage it is, I think a big lesson here is that you have to be able to show off what you have because it is important. Between a half-baked prototype and Robert F. Henry, or excuse me, Robert F. Smith, what became important here is that you gotta sell. And we very rarely have to sell in graduate stage. I even personally, when I think about sales, it has a negative connotation in my mind. But selling, guys, is so very important. So while you're going through your studies, if you get the opportunity, sell something. Sell your ideas, fundraise for your fraternity, which I did at Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Get, get a chance to sell. Now, granted, whenever you go and you start asking people for money, it's an entirely different sales process, but it still helps to get those experiences along the journey. When you talk to business folks, when you talk to our advisors, when you pitch to VCs, they want to hear about the market research that we've done. And oftentimes they want to hear about the market research before they even want to hear about the robotic mold. So here you'll see Katie talking to a group of folks out of Japan that develop robotic mowers at the largest conference in the country. Went there about three years in a row, not only to learn about where technology is going and how the industry is progressing, but also to scope out how other folks have approached technology so we can be different. Here on the right, you'll see a picture of me out in the field. We're in Michigan there, talking to some folks that mow alongside the highway. A lot of people don't realize it, but they just think about grasses when they walk outside their door, the stuff sitting right there next to their door. But grass is the most commonly grown crop in the world. There's more grass than anything else, more than hay and corn and soybeans and all that good stuff. It's a lot of grass all over the place. So it's, it's a $100 billion opportunity. It's a, lot of, um, it's a lot of money to be made and potential to be made in the industry. Does anybody know the story of John Henry? You know the story of John Henry put a one in the chat. The other thing that business folks really found fascinating, which completely blew Katie and our mind, is that they want to hear the origin of the, of the company and where the name came from. 
hired Henry. My name's not Henry. Katie's name's not Henry. We got a couple folks named Henry in our family, which is somewhat loosely connected. But the company is really named after John Henry. It's African-American folklore at the beginning of the 19th century. And his big claim to fame was that he was able to clear more land for the railroad tracks than anybody else. He's a fictional character. He was able to clear more land for railroad tracks than anybody else. His boss came in one day and he said, it's going to be a competition. John Henry, I just got a new machine, an automated machine, and you, you're going to compete. And whoever wins, they're going to get the job. So if the machine wins, John Henry, you're fired, and I'm going to use this machine now. The way the story goes, John Henry wins. He ends up beating the machine, drives more land than the machine can do. The irony is that he worked so hard that his heart completely gave out. He died in the process. So one, we named the company after John Henry to, to honor and recognize the contribution of modern day workers. A lot of people get very afraid when they hear about robotics and automation. We want to honor the tradition that modern workers have provided for us as a lifestyle. But the second big piece is we have to acknowledge where we're going in the future. That the future of work is going to require us to collaborate with robotics and automation, like the equipment that we're building here at Higher Hand. So we talked about bridging the perspective from an engineering to a business mindset. I want to talk a little bit about why strategy is so important and possibly more important to think about over technology. When I talk about strategy, I'm talking about what's going to be the cost of your technology, how are you going to position it against the market, what's going to be the return on investment, how are you going to distribute your product, what's the infrastructure, the safety, the partnerships, all that good stuff. All the stuff that typically engineers start to bore out at. If you came for like an academic presentation, I've sat through many of them where you're going through the derivation and going through the equations, this ain't it. Because the strategy is really where it becomes extraordinarily important and where I think that we've been able to shine as a company. Peter Thiel, another name that you should make a note of, has an engineering background, phenomenal entrepreneur, and very good at bridging that gap. Anybody heard of Peter Thiel? Heard of Peter Thiel, put a one in the chat. Peter Thiel, first and foremost, started PayPal. Second and foremost, he was the first investor in Facebook. He's done a lot of other things as well. He's a co-founder of Palantir. Very few folks have heard about Palantir. They primarily sell to the defense industry. But he's a phenomenal investor and a phenomenal entrepreneur in his own right. And he has this quote about how competition is for losers. Competition is, and that's, that's very counterintuitive. My co-founder is a basketball player. She loves competition. We had to debate whether or not competition was for losers or not. Competition, you don't want to compete against folks. You want to create your own personal white space. You want to position your product and your technology such that nobody can even compete with it. This is Burrow. Burrow has tackled the, the farming industry. We talk about dull, dangerous, and boring jobs. When folks think about picking watermelons and picking grapes, primarily out in California, it's extraordinarily boring. And the way that they've approached this problem is to make a very simple robot that has some autonomy in it. We call it semi-autonomy. But really, in the background, you have remote operators that are able to tap into the robot and guide it as necessary. That was a strategy choice that they made, to not just use autonomy, but to also use teleoperation in there to be able to get to market faster. But how many folks would even think about going into the, into the, the farming industry to help, not even to pick um, the strawberries or to pick the grapes or to spray herbicides, but instead to just move the crops around through the field? If you listen to that CEO, a wonderful explanation of why they decided to go down the path that they did, and it's all connected to strategy. Another company I want to highlight is Kiva. How many folks have heard of Kiva by a show of hands? Awesome. Put a one in the chat if you've heard of Kiva Systems. Very few folks have heard of it, but each one of us has been touched by Kiva's technology at some point. Kiva was purchased by Amazon 
in the early 2000s. And essentially what it is is a little robot that's able to go under our packages and move it around the warehouse. As you see in this picture, you don't see any people out here in the warehouse floor. It allows them to densely pack these packages into the warehouse and very efficiently move them around. In fact, as soon as you place an order on Amazon, they're already sending it to the robot and it's starting to reposition your package so that it can get up to the front and be ready to go by the time the delivery van comes up to pick it up. This is how they've been able to do one day shipping. You never hear about the technology, but the strategy behind it has completely allowed Amazon to dominate. Right? It's the strategy. Let's talk about higher handed and our strategy. We approached Hire Henry very similar to the way we could talk about Vera. It's a heavy duty commercial robotic lawnmower that's collaborative with commercial landscapers. They set up an area in our software very similar to Google Maps. It takes Henry, set it on the field, press go, and it mows the grass completely by itself. We wrap that up into a package that can fit in the back of a subcompact car. The reason that we've approached it this way is that we've realized that one, commercial landscapers have a very, very hard time scaling their business. If every time that you wanna grow your company, you have to buy a new truck, new trailer, equipment, insurance, storage facilities, find a person, make sure they stick around, make sure you keep customers to be able to stay with your scale, it's a huge challenge. Instead, if you're able to compact that process and ensure that it can fit in something like a subcompact car, you can reduce costs from anywhere to 40 to 60 percent. And really, if, for those that are PhD students and work in robotics, they look at this, and it's really not a crazy advanced technology. It's, it's, it's relatively simple. It does require a little bit of um, cleverness in the design to ensure that it's lightweight and it's able to operate for the amount of time that it needs to operate in. But overall, it's a relatively simple idea. It's the strategy behind it that makes it extraordinarily powerful and why so many of our commercial lawn care uh, business partners are so excited about it. The other thing that becomes important about higher energy is that it's also a dull and boring industry. Just like farming, just like logistics. Very few engineers would think about going into commercial lawn care. And we talk to investors and they're like, you two turned down six-figure jobs working at self-driving car companies to go into commercial longer? That's insane. But I think it's a part of what makes us special because we're going into this industry that a lot of people would overlook. The market I've already mentioned, the $100 billion market, is very large, very, very little competition, and has a huge labor problem. The folks our age, young millennials, they have the toughest time getting into the industry. Who wants to ride a, 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 a lawnmower in the high sun for eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, four, four months out of the year? Yeah, very few. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. And now what commercial landscapers are starting to recognize is that they're competing for labor against Walmart. They're competing for labor against Amazon where they can be where young folks can be pick workers or even a McDonald's. That the old idea of sitting on a rod and lawnmower for 10 hours a day, it is not going to stand up to the test of time. We're modifying that job to be for the modern day young millennial, young generation Z worker. When I talk about that ability to scale, to need to purchase new trucks and trailers every time you want to grow. For us to be able to make something that can fit in the back of a subcompact car, like I mentioned before, cuts those costs by 40 to 60 percent. We talked about Burrow using a remote operation. It allows you to get to market quicker. You don't need to build out all your autonomy features. Even like Tesla's done, they didn't wait until they had a fully autonomous car, right? They put it out there before it was fully autonomous. They made a phenomenal car in of its own right, and now they're starting to to make it more autonomous with, uh, with updates. The last piece that I want to mention on this slide before I start to transition into talking more about how it's important to get to market quickly is an idea of RAS, it's an acronym. If you've heard of RAS before, can you please put a one in the chat? Heard of RAS before. 
Those in the room, by a show of hands, have you heard of RAD? It stands for Robot as a Service. It's completely revolutionizing how folks are interacting with robots. It's always been too expensive. This model and this strategy is making those costs of robotics actually affordable to small and medium-sized companies. That's why we've taken a, a RAS approach. Robots as a service, but they also have machine as a service in manufacturing. They have equipment as a service in construction. Instead of spending $200,000 up front, $500,000 up front to get hold of the equipment, you pay a monthly fee. Same way you do for Spotify or YouTube or anything like that. So if you haven't thought about RAS and you're thinking about going into business or robotics business specifically, take a look at that business model. Talk about a couple examples of how folks have used strategy to get to market quickly. We got about 10 more minutes before we finish up and have some time for some Q&A. But by the show of hands, how many folks have heard of Voyage? Put a one in the chat if you've heard of Voyage. Voyage used strategy better than I've seen any other company. CEO, or the former CEO, you'll see why I say that in a minute. The former CEO, Oliver Cameron, listen to him speak, man. We talk about vision, we talk about selling a mission, he is phenomenal. Voyage makes self-driving car vans, as you can see in the picture here, but they focus primarily on the elderly. Instead of trying to tackle San Francisco like everybody's doing at Waymo and, and um, other self-driving car companies, I'm actually gonna pop up one of those here in a minute, which I also love. But instead of those companies trying to tackle San Francisco or instead of Tesla, primarily focusing on highway driving, they focus strictly on elderly communities primarily in Florida, where they have millions of folks living in, in these dense communities where the speed limit is around 30 miles per hour, where folks can no longer drive, they've lost their inability, and they are desiring to have the freedom to move around. Okay, they started in that market, they did a phenomenal job, they raised billions of dollars, they had a lot of fans, and literally just last week they got, brought, they got bought or acquired by cruise operators. By a show of hands, who's heard of, who's heard of Cruise? If you've heard of Cruise, put a two in the chat. See, uh, uh, more hands here about Cruise Automation. Another phenomenal self-driving car company. As you can see, I love companies about robotics, so if you ever want to talk about companies with robotics, please hit me up. Cruise Automation started in the early 2000s, and their, their stint of how they use strategy to their benefit was that they used a retro picture, which a lot of folks weren't doing at that time. They took an Audi, they put a retro fit kit on there with the main goal of doing an autonomous highway drive. A much simpler challenge, you don't have as many obstacles, you don't have pedestrians, a lot of challenges were reduced. That's how they got started. They built a prototype in a couple of months, approximately six months, they built a really good prototype. And they've been able to show a lot of traction. Because of that, they formed partnerships with General Motors. They formed partnerships with Honda. Recently, they acquired a Voyage. Just last week, they announced that Walmart just signed a partnership with them to deliver groceries. So these, these different ways of thinking about how to go into market becomes extraordinarily important. My favorite entrepreneur, not an engineer, although he sometimes seems like an engineer, he's actually a designer is James Dyson. Who's heard, heard of James Dyson by a show of hands? Uh, now we're getting more and more hands. Put a three in the chat if you've heard of James Dyson. The famous entrepreneur out of Britain. And what I like about Dyson, not only is you know, his ability to design very beautiful products that work what I assume would be extraordinarily well. Surprise in fact, I've never used one of his vacuums, but I'm a huge fan of of him as an entrepreneur and his company. Isn't that amazing? To never use one of the products but still be a huge fan. I read his autobiography around this time last year. And he talked about how he struggled for years to get traditional vacuum companies to embrace the idea of not using a bag. 
Nobody wanted to do it. Now, of course, if you go to Walmart and look at the vacuum aisle, you won't find not one vacuum with a bag. But when he was approaching the market, his strategy was so drastically different that nobody would even consider it. So the way that he approached this problem after trying for years to sell to Uber, who was a huge uh, vacuum manufacturer at the time, as well as some of the other big folks, Electrolux at the time, what he did was took out an ad in the, in the newspaper and said, hey, if you want to buy this, this vacuum cleaner, just ping me personally and we'll be able to get it to you. And that's how he got traction. That's how he started getting going. And once the big guy saw that he was eating up the market share, they said, okay, Maybe it's something here. And he, if you ever get a chance to listen to him speak, you won't find a lot of YouTube videos on him. He's from a very small country town, seems like he's a very laid back guy from his autobiography. So you won't hear him speak it often. But if you get a chance to read excerpts of his autobiography, he'll talk about how he was done wrong so many times by some of these big companies as he was learning his process. Education's expensive, y'all. I'm not just talking about tuition for college classes, but making mistakes, the time that it takes that you gotta spend to learn some of the things that you don't know, it's expensive. So he talks about some of those mistakes and I think he does a good job of articulating that can help some of us avoid some of those challenges. Here's one of my last slides. Another one of my favorite companies, this is Starship. Starship does delivery via a robot on a variety of different um, locations, but primarily on university campuses. And there are other companies that are, um, that are doing deliveries through cities, and now they're actually doing deliveries through cities as well. But they started off focusing on college campuses. You'll see here a video that they have with Purdue University. It went viral. Now, at this time, they had already been at UCLA and I think UC Berkeley and a couple other campuses. But this is the president of the university getting some food that he ordered out of one of Starship's robots. Not only do I like this strategy of starting on college campuses because it makes the challenge a lot easier from a technical perspective, but because they focused on that niche, they were able to get a very strong following of folks that really believed in what they were doing. And I think, thinking about a university strategy, for us as a university to think about how can we participate in activities like this to get national and international recognition, which nobody else is doing. I tell you what, there's not a campus you'll find in the United States right now that's using Henry. Science and Technology School, we've talked to the landscaping department here on campus. They're excited about what we're doing. We've talked to UMSL, we've talked about Mizzou. A lot of interest in how do we make these partnerships work and how do we test these robotic modes, and they're constantly giving us really good feedback. And I think that approaching these, these different scenarios in these different ways, again, is how you get the traction. Coming to the last couple of slides, these are some key resources. If you want to listen to, again, it's a lot of bad advice out there, if you want to listen to one of the best uh, YouTube videos of folks that have started the best tech companies in the world from investing in, matter of fact, before I even say that, who's heard of Y Combinator by a show of hands? Okay, if you've heard of Y Combinator, put a forward in the chat. Y Combinator is an angel investment firm out of California. They got the first investment in the Airbnb, into Dropbox, into DoorDash, and you gotta go to their website and look at the logos. How many companies that they started from the ground floor to help invest and give the right advice. They made all of their information in their lectures open source, put it all on YouTube for everybody to see. They're constantly uploading videos. So you can get the best advice out of Silicon Valley for free on YouTube. And they focus on tech companies. The one caveat that I will give is that they focus primarily on software. So if you're in the hardware space or in the robotic space, what we've kind of seen as we've experimented is that we have to tweak some of the advice that's given. But by and large, it is phenomenal advice for starting tech companies. Take a look at Y Combinator's YouTube channel. The other thing that we know is going to become extraordinarily important, and that's why it's such an exciting time to be a minor, such an exciting time to be an alum, 
is this new donation from the, that, that, that helped the founding of the Coomer Institute. There's going to be so much emphasis on entrepreneurship, I think. I think it's going to be a lot of support. So if you are an undergraduate student or graduate student that has an idea or thinking of an idea or think you may want to get into entrepreneurship, make sure you ping these folks. I think they're going to be a great resource as they continue to build out the program. You know about the doctoral fellowship program. I'm sure we've got a couple undergraduates in the room as well as on the call. If you're thinking about going into this space, take a look. Take a look. They have different verticals where they specialize in certain technologies, one of those verticals being autonomous robotics. Right, they already put my picture on the website. I didn't even know it. I was at leaving yoga one day. Somebody was like, you know they got you on the website, right, George? I was like, no, I didn't even know that, but that's great. So looking at these different opportunities are going to be helpful. Here are all of the uh, resources for the images that I use throughout the presentation. That's always important to include, especially at academic presentation, right? Got to say where you got the stuff from. Last thing I'll say in conclusion is that we've been killing it. We're going we're gonna to have about 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Hire Henry, we've been killing it. I talked a little bit about the business. I'm happy to talk more about the business. You guys didn't come here to hear primarily about us. You want to hear about what we've learned, what strategies are important, what technology is important. That's what we focused on. But you know, we've run won money from a variety of different sources. Most recently, we won a pitch competition, an international pitch competition from Alpha Lab here, Hardware Cup Pitch Competition. Only $3,000, a very small amount of money, but that's not the point. The point is we presented against venture capitalists from all around the world. We've gotten phenomenal connections from the events, and we got meetings scheduled already for the next couple of weeks, where we're gonna be talking more about our business with some very good investors. Because we won this competition for the robotics and artificial intelligence category, we'll be competing again in May at the beginning of May, with companies from Japan, and Sydney, Australia, and Amsterdam, and, um, and uh, I believe it's a company from Nigeria, competing with companies from all around the world for $50,000. And we're a small startup, as we all know, Kay just graduated in December, and I graduated this past May. Every dollar counts, every dollar counts. Like I said, we've raised over $130,000 to this point, the last thing that I'm going to mention about these funding resources and resources that you want to take a note of is WeFunding. Put a five in the chat if you've heard of WeFunding. Raise your hand in the room if you've heard of WeFunding. WeFunder is an equity crowdfunding platform. Very similar to Indiegogo, very similar to Kickstarter. With those two platforms, you go in there, you donate a little bit of money, and then the company guarantees you that they're going to ship you a they guarantee within certain um, stipulations that they're going to ship you a product within you know, six months or two years or whatever they specify in the pitch. With equity crowdfunding, however, instead of getting a product in return, you get equity stake in the company. You get equity, so if the company succeeds, you succeed. However much the company succeeds, you succeed proportionally. Why this is so important is that Previously, a lot of investors, a lot of regular day people were not able to be investors and invest in startups. That's why, you know, in 1999, a lot of our parents didn't invest in Microsoft or Apple in the 80s or something. They didn't even know about it. They didn't have the opportunity. There was a law starting back in, I think, 1933, where a lot of people, regular everyday people, lost money in the gold rush. People were selling them snake oil, and they put their whole life savings into it and lost it all. So in 1933, the government passed legislation saying everyday people cannot invest in startups. As a matter of fact, a startup can't even solicit to everyday people to invest in their company. You have to be what's called an accredited investor. You have to have over $250,000 of income and a net worth of over a million dollars, excluding your primary domicile. You gotta have a little bit of money in order to invest. This company, WeFunder, they lobby Congress for years the Jobs Act that Obama signed, I think it was 2012, allowed everyday people to be able to invest in startups. Right? So it's, it's something I think is going to transform the, the, the 
equity crowdfunding and the startup scene. That's why I say, if you are considering starting a business, now is a really good time to do it. As a matter of fact, because of COVID, they just passed more legislation on March 15th to make it even easier. Less paperwork you gotta file, um, you get more time to file the paperwork, more money that you can raise, you can raise up to $5 million in a lot of situations very, very easily. If you wanna contact me, or if you wanna contact Katie, the best way is to add us on LinkedIn, the business is on all relevant social medias, everything from LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We post pictures and videos and how we're fundraising and successful fundraising. And you can access our LinkedIn and all our social medias at our website at HireHenry.us. A lot of good information about what we're doing on our website as well, from our mission and the market, more about our team, news, all that good stuff, HireHenry.us. Thank you guys, I appreciate you listening. So let's, let's take a couple, couple minutes for Q&A. I think Katie's moderating, moderating the, um, or keeping an eye on the Q&A function of Zoom. So if you have any questions there, feel free to put those in, in the, in the Q&A feature as opposed to the chat. They should. There's, there's no Q&A. There's no Q&A. Okay. Put it in the chat. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Instead of putting it in the Q&A, if you're on Zoom, please put it in the chat. Um, anybody in the room have any thoughts or any questions they want to put forth? Copy. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering if you were you trying to sell those robots or you would just uh, bring them when somebody needs them and then just use them and then bring them back. So the question is, are we trying to sell these robotic mowers, or are we going to bring it to people and let them use it for a while and then take it back, or how exactly are we doing that? And that's part of that, that acronym RAS that we were talking about, Robot as a Service. But you can think about it kind of like a, a leasing model or a rental model, long-term leasing model. So what we do is we go to commercial landscapers, so your season's for five months in Missouri where you really mow grass. We can do a long-term lease, leasing agreement where they might sign an agreement for six to 12 months or something like that. They'll be able to use the robot for that time, and once that time period ends, they return the robot to us. That allows us to have different stipulations, like you can't crack the box on the robot. Now open it up and start tinkering with the hardware, and I don't know if you guys know, but like farm guys on tractors and a lot of folks that know how to work a wrench, they like to crack it open, see how it works, let me weld something. I'll do it myself. So I know other people are going to want to do it. Um, we put stipulations like, hey, you can't do that in, in, in the rental agreement or in the leasing agreement. So that's, that's how we're planning on getting these to early customers. Great question. Yes, sir. The Q was first. What's your timeline then? You said you had uh, investment and whatnot, but what's your timeline on getting the customers and what's six months and a year look like? The question is what's our timeline? What does it look like six months, 12 months from now? Didn't talk much about that, so I appreciate that question. It gives me an opportunity to talk about it. Right now, we're playing, we're doing beta tests. So we got meetings scheduled with customers where we're going out, we're demonstrating the technology, they're giving us feedback. We're cutting grass and all that good stuff, and we're improving the prototype. What we've learned from interacting with our customers um, so often is that the prototype has to be at a certain phase. When we talk about good advice and bad advice with startups, particularly with software startups, we talked about getting the market quick. That's very important, and there's a lot of emphasis in the startup community in doing that. But when you got something like a robotic mower, you gotta slow down sometimes and ensure that all the safety's there. So our focus over the last several years is getting the prototype to a point where it has all the safety features that are needed and it's able to meet the expectation of customers. After doing these beta tests between now and the end of the season, which is about October, November, we go into kind of like what you would consider a, a hermit mode in terms of testing with customers. We take the data that we've learned from the spring and the summer, the early part of the fall, and we iterate on the product. It gives us an opportunity to circle back around with investors and say, look at what we've accomplished. Look at all the YouTube videos and LinkedIn videos that we've posted. Look at all the progress, look at all the followers that we've increased. 
and we can talk to investors about what that means about higher energy going forward. That time is also taken to look at how do we ensure that we have the proper product certifications, how do we ensure that our compliance is taken care of. If you have any type of electromagnetic device, whether that be a cell phone or a robot, there's a certification process that you have to go through. We work with testing labs all around the country, everybody from the FCC to safety testing labs like UL to ensure that we're checking all the right boxes to make sure that when that time comes approximately a year from now, we design our products such that it can meet those safety standards. So we'll go through that process of testing and then we can start to do what's called small batch manufacturing. Getting a couple of these units made and then letting customers interact with us and uh, give us feedback over next summer. That's approximately an 18 month timeline from a high level, excluding all the important uh, strategy pieces that I can't mention that Katie's like blurring at me, like you better not say too much about what we plan on doing over the next 12 months. Yes, sir. Is the, is the end goal to sell like the design and idea to a larger company or to keep it on your own home name and keep it growing? Our focus is to build a very strong and powerful company, right? We want to impact a lot of people's lives. We're not thinking about selling to anybody at any point. But even if we were, we probably wouldn't tell you. That's part of strategy. It's very important. If people think you want to sell, then they can bargain with you a lot better. So just a tip. You don't want to, you typically don't want to talk about that, especially in a forum like this. Um, do I think that there will be companies that will want to buy higher energy? Absolutely, because I think this is the future. I wouldn't be working on it if I didn't think it's the future. I don't think a lot of companies like, uh, it's over 10 different mower manufacturers. A lot of people only think about John Deere when they hear about mowers. But 10 different manufacturers, most of them being in Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, right here in the Midwest. These companies are going to be looking for technologies like higher energy. Will they be able to afford us? I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's the question. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I got one. Yes, sir. So you guys have been mentioning about how you've been winning all these competitions, getting all this funding and all that stuff. So, which has been, you know, the most satisfying? You know, what's been your most satisfying accomplishment on for you and your co-founder? Which? You know. Okay, I'm gonna let Katie take that first. Katie, right. what's been the most satisfying? The question is, after after everything that we've accomplished with uh, raising money with building the product, with interacting with customers, all the traction that we've been able to gain so far, what has been most satisfying? And the question has been posed not only to me, but to my co-founder, Kate. So, that's a great question, actually. I think the most satisfying thing is not only the winning, but getting to know the market getting to know how much possibilities out there, um, getting to work in what you're really passionate about, having fun and enjoying what you, what you do. And not only that, I think the most fascinating thing for me, after 300 plus interviews, running around the country in the middle of class, I have um, modeling, I had thermodynamics, I had a lot of class, and I feel like I was running around the country interviewing landscapers in the side of the road, literally one time, we even knocked into somebody's window while they were asking for a coffee in McDonald's. That's how crazy it was. <laughs> but the most satisfying part was knowing all this theory that I learned in class that I thought that it was useless, that I thought that my professor was just crazy about it. I was like, yeah, I will never use this. Yeah, once I go to the industry, it will not happen. Seeing all that actually being applied into the design, into not only um, the software, the hardware, every single thing I learned in class, it was actually worth it. Every single piece, which I was mind blowing. And every time I had to encounter this, George was like, do you remember when you saw that equation in class? I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, I think this number one, and number two was getting to know the market and how big it is and how amazing it is in the US, because coming from a different country, it's completely different. I let George continue there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with okay. Katie. It's a lot of, thank you, a lot of very interesting pieces about the market, 
that we've learned about technology. But since we're talking to primarily engineers and graduate students, you know, you guys are in this because you enjoy seeing things being made and seeing things come together. For us to have been working for years at Higher Henry and years developing our prototype, to see this thing come together, to see folks like you guys go out and follow us on social media and like our posts. I just took a look at the Zoom participants. Thank you guys so much for showing up. These are people that we see are liking our content on social media and resharing and reposting us. That's, that's, that, that's what makes it for me, that people are starting to see our vision and starting to see what we're working on. Um, but back to my first point, I got distracted by wanting to say thank you for everybody that's paying support. But in addition to that, it's just making something seeing a dream that you've had for years. My fraternity co brother called me right before the event. He was like, George, I just want to say congrats, bro. We was roommates five years ago. You used to be dreaming, staying up late at night, trying to program this thing, no hardware. The hardware that we did have was falling apart. The dream you had five years ago, you actually do it. You got a presentation going on, you raising money. And for me, it's just, I love it. I love to be able to see the fact that we're making it happen. We got the right team, we got the right time, we're able to get the resources, so we're gonna make it happen. Any other questions? We got a couple more minutes here. Yes, sir. How do you manufacture the motor play board? Where do you go for that? Do you outsource them or? The question is, how do we manufacture these different motors? It's a really good question. That's something I always wanted, even as I was going through mechanical engineering. How do you, one, get a product certified, second, how do you get it manufactured? And what I've learned is that there's different levels and different scales to manufacture. So if you're doing one or two units, you might go to a machine shop, similar to what we have here in the department. You might get different components made, and then you'll take those components back to your house and assemble them and test them and make sure you got the right design. And once you do, you might want to do 10 to 15 different units, like we talked about small batch manufacturing, where you may put some type of an agreement together with a local machine shop or fabricator to get those, those parts made. And you may, one, assemble them yourself, or you'll go the Apple route. You'll get a couple family members and friends, and you'll get a pizza and invite everybody over to the garage and hopefully get them to help you put it together. And then once you're at a larger scale, you know, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of units, you can go to the big manufacturers and say, hey, there's something here. We, we've shown a lot of traction. Here's some proof of concept of what we got going on. It may be local in the United States, or it may be overseas. And you start to make that case of why they should invest uh, millions of dollars oftentimes in what you're trying to produce. And I, I say that very clearly. If they're a manufacturer, a lot of times they are investing in you. Even if they're not writing a check, they have a equipment and facilities that they can be using on other things instead of your product. So you have to show them how what you're building is going to grow to something big as opposed to them manufacturing somebody else's goods. So you're selling them and you're getting them to invest in you a lot of ways once you get to hundreds of thousands, millions of units type of thing. That middle gap between small batch manufacturing and large scale manufacturing is actually known in the hardware industry to be very difficult to bridge. So we're still learning more about that. We got mentors that have gone through that process and helping us navigate that when the time comes. Okay, okay I wanna make sure there's no questions in the chat. Awesome, thank you guys. We really appreciate you coming. We really appreciate you guys you know, taking time on a Friday right before the weekend. Thank you folks on Zoom. We appreciate it and we look forward to continuing the conversation on LinkedIn. Thank you.